Thank you, Dr. Aiken. I told this story to Dr. Aiken last night at dinner, but when uh, I first met Dr. Aiken, it was in Evansville, Indiana, he was preaching at an evangelism conference there. And at the time, I was beginning uh, a political career. I worked as a political operative in Southern Indiana and had aspirations to do that. And a friend invited me to go to an evangelism conference. I don't remember which friend or why that seemed like a good idea, but I went. And Dr. Aiken was preaching on Revelation 5. It's the first time I'd ever heard an expositional sermon in my entire life. I walked out of that room, called my fiance, who is now my wife, uh, and said, I just found out what I want to do with the rest of my life. I'm not going to law school. I'm going to seminary. She said, which seminary? I said, Southeastern. She said, where's that? I said, I have no idea. But the guy who's the president of that just preached the best sermon I've ever heard, and I want to go learn how to do that from him. And whatever God has accomplished in Cleveland through City Church, and at least in part, brother, it is owing to that sermon that I heard. So thank you for that. Also want to acknowledge that Dr. Ed Litton is here, my mentor uh, in the faith. When I met Ed, I was a struggling church planter in Phoenix, Arizona at the convention uh, with a lot of questions and nowhere to go for answers. And uh, since that day, I've been able to pick up the phone anytime I need it. I tell people all the time that whatever God has done at City Church, it's owing to the truth of the gospel, the faithfulness of God to his promises, and the ability to call Ed Litton. So very thankful for you, brother, as well. If you have your Bible, would you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2? I want to look at the first five verses there. Being at Southeastern uh, is a humbling experience for me. It was when I first came here as a student. I remember when I got here, my father was a pastor. I grew up in the church. I was confident. I knew a lot of things. And so the first place I went uh, was to the ministry referral office. And I asked, I gave them my resume and said, hey, I'd love to get a job uh, at a church while I'm here. I went to class for two weeks, went back to the ministry referral office, said, please give me my resume back. Don't send it to anyone. Apologize to anyone that you've sent it to. I don't know anything. Southeastern has always been a humbling place. It's humbling to be back. I saw that on Thursday, uh, J.D. Greer preached here. You know, in sports, they have a saying, you never want to be the guy who follows the guy. You always want to be the guy who follows the guy who follows the guy. And that's really good news for whoever preaches in chapel on Thursday. Not so much for me. It's a humbling experience to be here. Uh, but I have found in seven years in Cleveland, many of that, much of that time spent realizing what I don't know and what I, when I wasn't prepared for, I have found that God can work mightily in that humility. And that's a little bit what I want to talk to you about this morning as we look at the first five verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we see how Paul describes his ministry to the church at Corinth. And I want you, I just want to kind of give you a word of encouragement that brothers and sisters coming back from the field to this school that changed my life as you sit here, here's what I want to tell you. You are at Southeastern to learn how to be simple. That what the concept, what, whatever context you go, what they need is the simplicity in ministry that the Apostle Paul articulates he had at Corinth here in these five verses. And so as we get ready to read them, let me go ahead and give you kind of a three-point outline I'm going to use to walk through these five verses. And if you're a note taker, you can jot these down. The first thing I'll want to show you is what our aim must be in ministry, what our aim must be. Number two, I will want to show you what then our methods should be. And then number three, where our confidence can be. Okay, so what our aim must be, what our methods should be, and where our confidence can be. But before we do that, let's look at the text together. The Apostle Paul says this, And I, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's, let me start by showing you in ministry what our aim must be. The Apostle Paul, I think, articulates two things that motivated his ministry, that served as his focus to the church at Corinth. One is obvious, and then one is a little less obvious. One will get right away, and one, if we're not careful, we might miss. And the first one, the obvious one, is that he went to Corinth with a singular goal, and that is that people might develop faith in Jesus Christ. 
That the goal of gospel ministry is leading people to grab hold of the person and work of Jesus. That, that's probably not shocking to you. It shouldn't be shocking to you that our goal, wherever we go, whether it's Cleveland, whether it's overseas, whether it's somewhere here in North Carolina, we go exhorting people to trust in Jesus' life for their righteousness, his death for their atonement, his resurrection for their hope. That is the message of Christianity, trust in Jesus. Of course, ministry is not about holding ourselves out as people to, to be like or to emulate or to worship or to adore. Uh, our goal is to go and talk about somebody else. Our desire is when we leave that people would say, we miss him or we miss her, but we love Jesus. We, they have given us Jesus. Our faith is in Jesus. Our hope is in Jesus. Since that's obvious, let me just kind of assume you're on board with that and show you the second thing that he says he says when I was with you I wanted you to believe in Jesus verse 5 so that your faith but look what he says might not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God in other words Paul says when I was in Corinth I didn't just want you to believe I wanted you to believe in such a way that you recognize the cause of your belief was God himself that I wanted to do ministry in a way in which that, yes, you came to faith. You would have articulated, I once did not believe and now I believed. I once looked inwardly for righteousness and now I look to Christ. I, I once looked to my external actions of religion for some hope of atonement, but I now look to what Christ has done on the cross. I once looked to my own machinations for hope, but now I look to his resurrection. Yes, but I wanted all that to be accomplished in such a way that if somebody said, who told you that? You would say, I don't remember the guy's name, but it was really God. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I don't know if you know this, but it's true. It is possible to lead people to faith, quote unquote or not, in such a way that they would attribute their believing in Christ to your intellectual prowess. It is possible to move to a context where you are the smartest person in the room and where people will simply be overwhelmed by your analogies and your points and they'll say, well, you know, we can't think of an argument to defeat them, so we might as well just become Christians. I got guys all the time coming to City Church who are there even willing to become Christians if the girl that brought them will date them. And so their testimony would be, I've come to faith in the power of her looks. There are other people who, in given a context, will say faith is an avenue to move up in my company. Faith is an avenue to get a country club membership. Faith is an avenue to find a moral center. We have families all the time who come to City Church and say, we started having kids and we thought maybe they ought to be in church. Maybe they ought to be exposed to some morality. Their faith is in the power of a moral center. But Paul says, no, 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 no. When I was in Corinth, I wanted to do ministry in such a way that people would say, we have gone from death to life through the power of God himself. He may have used this sermon, he may have used this song, this teacher, this leader, this Bible study, but at the core, we could not shake this feeling that God himself was winning us to himself. This is what Paul meant in Ephesians 2, right? When he said, you've been, you've been made alive. God himself has, but God who is rich in mercy has caused you to come alive. And Paul said, I wanted everywhere that I went for there to be faith, but faith directly attributed to God. That the danger here for us is that often what we crave most personally is the antithesis of this. Because I'm like you, I like to preach a sermon and then have an email in the inbox that says, hey, Zach, you really nailed it. I got this one guy, Gino, at my church, older Italian guy, and he always comes up afterwards a sermon and he just looks at me and he's almost like he's speechless. He just comes up to me and he says, Zach, I don't know what that means, but it seems good, so I'm gonna go with it. 
right? And I like that. I like that. I like it enough that when he doesn't do that, I start to wonder what, where, where did I miss the moment in the sermon? I blew it. I've got to go back and watch the tape and, and, and course correct. Listen, we want people to say, it is clear your studies have paid off. It is clear that you're articulate, but listen, here's Paul's danger. This is what Paul's talking about in all of Corinthians. He's saying, if that is the reason why they believe it is so easily lost, It's so easily shaken. It's the girl being interested in a different guy away from him not coming. It's you moving and a new preacher coming in away from going away. It is a good Netflix series and binge watching it away from them no longer standing with Christ. Our aim is not just that people would come to believe in Jesus, but they would do so in such a way that they would say, God has moved in my life. That is our aim. That is our aim. Now that's very exciting. It's very exciting to think about being used by God, but it's also very sobering because you can't engineer that. So you say, if that's my aim, if my aim is to lead people to faith in such a way, according to Paul, that their faith might rest not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. God. That's why Paul says, when I was with you, I did not, verse four, my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom. He's saying, I was very clear with you that I'm not leading you to Christ because I'm the smartest man in the room. I'm leading you to Christ because his name is the power of God to save sinners. But if that's our aim, then what should our methods be? That leads me to my second point. If our aim is to see people come to faith in God through the power of God, to come to faith in Christ through the power of God, the kind of faith that is unshakable because it's from God himself, the kind of faith that will exist when you leave your church, whether through death after a long ministry or by going to another church, the kind of faith that will sustain no matter whether the relationship ends or doesn't, whether the kids find their moral center or not. If that's the kind of faith we want to see, if that's the kind of faith we want our ministries to be, How do you go about that? I don't know when you were a kid, if you had any experience with choose your own adventure books. Do you know choose your own adventure books? Like kind of like the precursor to video games. A really sad precursor, but a precursor nonetheless. My son went to the library the other day and he brought one home. It was a book on how to climb Mount Everest, right? And so if you're unfamiliar with the genre, I don't know if you study Choose Your Own Adventure at Southeastern or not, but if you're unfamiliar with the genre, this is the way it works. You read about 15 pages of, of a backstory and then you make a choice. And if you, you know, choose to go up the mountain, then you turn to page 17. If you choose to sleep and get a little extra rest that night, you turn to page 49 and that's how it goes. And my son came into my room very frustrated. He said, Dad, I've read this 15 times. I haven't made it up the mountain a single time. This book is the worst. And I said, well, buddy, you just gotta, you just gotta keep trying. And so he went to his room, back to his room. He comes back two minutes later. He says, made up the mountain. I was like, wow, that was quick. He said, yeah, I just went to the last page where you get up the mountain and I worked backwards. <laughs> smart kid, devious, sinner, but smart kid. And brothers and sisters, that's what we have to do. If our aim is to produce people who love Jesus, who cling to Jesus because of the power of God, we have to start there and work backwards and say, if that's what we want to produce, if that's what we want our ministries to lead to, what then are our methods? What's our, what kind of a methodology derives from that aim as its source? And I think Paul gives us three things that were his methods, three practical methods that he had with him in Corinth so that they would have faith, but not just faith, but faith faith that came from the power of God. Here they are, three things. Number one, he was a simple person. He was a simple person. Look what he says, verse three. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Now the commentators are divided over what Paul means when he says that. Could be that he had some kind of physical malady that caused him problems. It could be his background as a persecutor of the church made him, uh, humbled him and shook him and made him worry about people calling him a hypocrite. It could have been that Paul just didn't deem himself a very good public speaker. We don't really know. I'm not sure the what matters, the why matters. Paul's point is that I wanted you to see this is the power of God. And the method I chose to display that is to live among you in such a way that you said, if there's power in this man's ministry, it does not come from him. 
Brothers and sisters, are you aware that one of the primary methods you have to lead people in God's grace through God's sovereignty to faith in Christ through the power of God is to show them that you are not capable of producing it on your own. It's to be a man or woman of weakness, of fear, of trembling. What what, what does that mean? Well, I think in one way it means that pastors and leaders have to go back to living in community. You have to be known. At City Church, my wife and I are a part of a community group. We're not part of the executive circle community group, the inner circle community group, where only certain people can know our problems or difficulties. We're with regular people. They're hearing me talk about the things that are going on in my life, even, even more beneficial for this purpose. They're hearing my wife talk about the things that are involved in being married to me. And their takeaway from that two hours a week every Wednesday is this. If God's doing something at our church, it's not because Zach and Amy are awesome. They are very regular people. They're very ordinary people. One of the ways we do this is we have people in our homes. We're in other people's homes where they see our kids misbehave. They see us lose our temper. They see us do passive aggressive digs at our spouses and back. Not because it's okay, but because in seeing that we also are sinners in weakness, they will marvel at the glory of God who's moving in our midst. We must be weak people, simple people, regular people. That's one of our methods. And for if you're like me and you struggle with pride, that means you gotta die daily to that because pride is the antithesis of this. There's a part of me that wants people to say, I'm a Christian because man, Zach, his sermons are just so logically tight. You know, I didn't wanna be a Christian, but it just, he just compelled me. I didn't wanna be a Christian. He said, for my third point, I just repented right there. He's so smart. But that's not authentic Christianity. They need to see through me, literally through me, so that they look at what I'm saying and say, you don't don't always look like the best ambassador of that. And I said, well, I'm a sinner in need of Jesus. And whatever God is doing in me and through me at City Church, it's his glory. We're gonna be simple people. Second, we have to have a simple message. Look at what he says. This is maybe the put on a poster verse of this passage, verse two. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We have to be careful with this because I don't think that Paul means he got up to preach and just said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and sat down. Have you read the book of Romans? Paul wasn't simple in a rudimentary or elementary sense. He was simple in this way. His answer for all things was the gospel of Jesus Christ. When he says, I decided, which by the way, implies intentionality. I could have gone here. I could have gone there. I could have used this. But instead, what I decided was to make sure that you understood I was bringing to you as the answer for everything, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gospel centrality is the method of leading people to faith in Christ through the power of God. Because what it says to them is, if you want a healthy marriage, you must first find your identity in Christ. If you want to raise children in a way that is loving and challenging and rewarding, you need to not make them idols, instead getting your identity from Christ. If you want to overcome bitterness in your family, you need to find forgiveness in Christ that will enable you to offer it to others. Gospel centrality is the method that leads people to say, this is the glory of God. But that is not why people come to our churches. That's why it takes intentionality because they come to our churches saying, my marriage is on the brink of falling apart. Can you help me fix it? I'm struggling with my 13 year old. Can you help me gain some control? I'm unfulfilled at work and I don't know what to do. They, they want pragmatic uh, lessons, but what they need is a gospel that transforms. But we fight against that. I think the way churches run the risk of running afoul here of what Paul is talking about is not by being overly complex. I think it's by doing what I'll call gospel plus. And this is what I mean. It means that the sermon, it goes a little something like this. Here are five ways you can be a really good dad. And we unpack those five principles of fatherhood and we flesh that out and everyone can resonate with that. You don't have to be a Christian to wanna be a good dad. My next door neighbor, Brian, probably won't watch this, not a Christian. He's a great dad. 
He will come here, you talk about five ways to be a good dad. And then when you finish that, they add on a little thing. They say, of course, none of this means anything if you don't know the heavenly father. That's gospel plus. It's like they're selling you a car and you can choose to upgrade the leather seats. We wanna make you a good dad. And if you'd like, we'll even upgrade you to a relationship with God. But see, even if you win someone with that, even if they're converted, even if they're baptized, even if they become a member, when you say to them, why do you believe? They won't say the power of God. Do you know what they'll say? I realized in my life I need to be a better father. And this pastor has some really good principles on being a father. Is that what you want the exit interviews of your Sunday mornings to be? I was at a church not too long ago in Ohio where 15 minutes of the service was an executive from a local Fortune 500 company talking about how you can get promoted in your job. That was 15 minutes of a service of a Christian church. Brothers and sisters, listen. They will want that. They will crave that. They'll be looking for some new angle, some way you can leverage it. That's where you have to say, if I want them to come to faith in Jesus in such a way that they will marvel at the power of God, I accomplish that by saying, no matter what brought you here, I've got one thing for you, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul does this over and over again in the epistles, does he not? Ephesians, gospel, gospel, gospel. Finally, let's talk about mothers and fathers and masters and slaves and husbands and wives. But the overwhelming majority of what Paul has to say is believe this, hold on to this, cling to this, work out this. Gospel centrality is not a talking point that you blog about on the Gospel Coalition. It is the epicenter of a ministry that will lead people to say, pastors come and go, but the power of God leads us to Christ. It is not an upgrade to the package of the Christian ethic. It is the center. It's the car, not the leather seats. You may or may not see a bump in your fathering ability. I would like to think that following Jesus will inform your fatherhood in a way that will breathe life into your family. But the gospel is the center, not your felt need. The third method that Paul commends to us here in 1 Corinthians 2 is the greatness of God. The first two set the table for the third, right? The simple people with a simple message provides a canvas on which the glory of God can be painted. It can be displayed. If you could get this maybe mostly if you read all five verses. So let's just do that together. Listen to what he says. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I believe what Paul is saying is that simple people with a simple message create an environment where when the spirit falls, the right source will get the glory. Proud people with a proud message contextual people with contextual messages that place the emphasis on the context and not the source of truth do not create an atmosphere for the spirit because if the spirit did fall we would leave praising preachers and music leaders and teachers and books but simple people and simple and simple messages lead to the spirit being able to work in such a way that people would marvel at the glory of God and here's the thing biblical theology tells us it has always been this way who was Noah? A simple guy with a simple message. It's going to rain. It's never rained. I know it's going to rain. You should get on the boat. Who was Abraham? His father's name dates back to a moon worshiping pagan religion. He's a pagan moon worshiping old guy who can't have children, whose message is keep walking. Who will say to his wife, God's going to give us a child. Who will say to his son, God's going to provide a ram. Simple man, simple message. Who's Moses? He's a simple 
simple man, a fugitive of justice with a simple message, let my people go. And God splits the Red Sea and drops bread from heaven and gets water from a rock. Who is David? A simple boy with a simple message that God, uh, my God is greater than you, you giant. And God shows up. Who are the apostles? They are simple men hiding in the upper room in Acts 1 till the spirit falls and glory fills the nations. It has always been this way. Simple people, simple message, great, faithful, glorious God. Isn't that what the writer of Hebrews is saying in Hebrews chapter 11 when he says, by faith, so-and-so did this and by faith, so-and-so did that. And he goes through the whole list. He even gets to the end, which I, is kind of like the junk drawer, like in case I left anybody out, they did this and they did that and he did this. He goes through all these people and then what does he say in Hebrews chapter 12? Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, what does he say? Pick your favorite one, get a poster of them, put it on your wall. Turn them into a little bobblehead, put it on your dashboard. No. He says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also, right, let us join them in fixing our eyes on Jesus. He goes through the whole so-called hall of faith, and he says the only way any of these people did any of those things is they were simple people with a simple message who fixed their eyes on a God who's great. Brothers and sisters, you are here not to exceed them, but to learn to join them. To go wherever it is you go with simple people, simple message, great God. I've seen this in seven years at Cleveland. I've seen this. I minister in a part of Cleveland called University Circle. It's the fastest growing part of Cleveland. Doctors and lawyers at Case Western Medical School, law school, people who are getting PhDs and things that I don't understand. When we first, I can't even spell, let alone understand. When we first moved to Cleveland, uh, our next door neighbor was a lady named Maritza. She was a single mom of a little boy, and she was simultaneously getting her PhD and her MD in genetics. Those are the people we minister to. But what we're finding overwhelmingly is that the simplicity of who we are and what we have to say is the medium through which God works. Let me give you a quick anecdote. There was a girl named Karen, grew up in San Francisco. She never, nominal Buddhist family, never been to a Christian church, moved to Cleveland for medical school, got got lonely, made a friend. That friend went to City Church, invited her to come. She came one Sunday, sent me an email. So that was the first Christian service I've ever been to. Can we get coffee? I have a lot of questions. I said, yeah, that's the email you're happy to get, right? So I went and got coffee with her and she sits down and looks at me. She's come from the hospital. She's wearing the clothes from the hospital. She says, first question, I just came from the hospital where I watched a six-year-old die of leukemia. So you tell me how you believe in a good God when that can happen. That's a big question. That's a good question. We met for six months every week at that coffee shop. About the third month, uh, finally, we sit down. She's in the midst, and we'd meet for two, three hours at a time. She would bring a sheet of questions. She'd listen, and she'd jot down what everything that I said. And so finally, after three months, I looked at her and said, Karen, I got a question for you. She bristled. I'd never asked a question. And she said, okay. And I said, let me ask you a question. You're smarter than me. You're more educated than me. You're more sophisticated than me. You're more accomplished than me. Why do you keep coming here to listen to me talk about Jesus? And she looked at me very kind person, but didn't contradict anything that I had just said. (laughs) And she said, I don't know. I don't know. I looked at her and I said, I'll tell you why. The Bible tells us that God's Holy Spirit is present and active and working on the hearts of people to convict them concerning sin and righteousness. Three months later, she's in line to take communion at City Church. That's how we respond to the sermons every week. And one of our pastors pulls her out of line and says, Karen, you know, we say every Sunday, this is for Christians and we know you're here and you're working through Christianity. We just don't want you to confuse sign with substance. And she very kind, she waited for the whole thing, listened to the whole thing. And she said, no, 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 this is for me. I'm with Jesus, I believe. Six months of questions. And every time I left that encounter at the coffee shop, I only knew two things. Number one, I had butchered every question she had asked. And number, and number two, it, but for the grace of God, she would never want to see me again. Six months we met. Six months she was converted. She's now an ER doctor in the inner city of Chicago preaching Jesus to patients. And if you ask Karen, why do you believe? She would not tell you because I met with some moronic pastor in a coffee shop. She would tell you because God won me to himself brothers and sisters begin 
with the end in mind. What do you want them to say? Who do you want them to give the glory to? Positive emails are a great encouragement to me, but I do not want them to say, if Zach leaves, we'll never survive. I want them to say, Zach's come and go. Jesus is the one who saves us. Number three, where can we go for confidence? Anecdotes are nice, but you don't know Karen, and someone like Karen may never come to your church. So where can you go for confidence? Because there's part of us that says, no, 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 no. I got I to gotta, I gotta be the smartest person. I got to be the most complex. I got to find whatever the felt needs of my context are and start there. I got to have the best programs. And let me tell you something. You can, when I left Southeastern, uh, I was an ecclesiological warrior, man. I would do violence to anybody who had terrible ideas about the church. But when I planted City Church, in October of 2011, the next January, the first Sunday that January, we had seven people in attendance. That includes me and the guy leading music. So technically we had five, but we counted ourselves because we're Baptists. (laughs) I don't care what you say your ecclesiology is now. When you plant a church and you got seven people who show up, you start to think whether or not you ought to adapt your methods. When you go to your first church and you begin to preach the gospel and 20 people leave, you'll start to rethink your methods. When you write a book and no publisher wants to buy it, you will start to rethink your methods. So in that moment, where can you go to really grab hold of this idea that simple people with a simple message are used of God? Well, Paul tells us in Corinthians 1, verse 22, where he says this, for Jews demand signs and Greeks demand Seek wisdom, look what he says. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, let me tell you something, the life and ministry and death of Jesus can be distilled in this way. Who was Jesus? He was a simple man. Isaiah tells us nothing about him that would commend him. There's no reason to turn your head. He was not the latest, greatest thing. He was a simple man with a simple message. The kingdom of God is at hand. The scriptures are about me. God has been getting you ready for me. It's me Moses talked about. It was me that Abraham had fixed his eyes on. It is me you need to believe in. I will judge the nations. You will destroy this temple and I I will raise it up. Simple man, simple message. And when he went to the cross, everyone laughed at his ministry model. This can't be God. This is simple. This is stupid. This can't be God. This cannot be the Messiah. This cannot be what God is about. And they killed him. And on Saturday, the simple man, the simple message made no sense. But praise God, on Sunday, that ministry model came alive quite literally. What is the source of confidence that if we preach the gospel and live the gospel as fellow struggling followers of Jesus, that God's glory will show up? It is simply this, that Jesus Christ did that himself. He emptied himself, Paul says, but God rose him from the dead and it's in his name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. When you're tempted to get sexy, when you're tempted to cut a corner, when you're tempted to buy into the cultural zeitgeist of the day, resist that because your confidence is in this. Jesus showed me those who trust God to be faithful to his promises will not be disappointed. People say to me all the time, church planners will call me, email me, say, Zach, what advice would you give to me if I'm going to plan a church? If that's you, I'd love to meet you afterwards. or I'd love to talk with you about that, but this is the advice I give. You don't even have to ask. Here's what I say. I said, my experience of church planting has taught me two things. The gospel is true. It's true. That's not that I went to Cleveland not knowing that, but it's one thing to know that intellectually, to believe that personally. It's another thing to see it change people's lives in front of you, people that you've met with, people who look to you for answers that you don't have, that marriages you can't fix, families you can't reconcile, but the gospel does. And God, the second one is God is faithful to his promises. The whole Bible is the story of God's faithfulness to his people. And brothers and sisters, we get to join that. As we stand saying, wherever it is we go, rural context, urban context, 
American context, somewhere else, we say, I have decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified so that your faith, adding in verse five, might not rest in my wisdom, but in the power of the God who sent me. Brothers and sisters, you are not at Southeastern for any other reason but this, to learn how for the glory of God and the good of the nations to be simple. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you for this school. All the good things that happened in my life, my wife's life, so many friends. Thank you for the good things that are happening now and the good things that will happen. Thank you for the leaders of this school. And thank you for your providence that you are preaching this message to us of simplicity by getting a very simple guy who went here to articulate a very powerful message that is yours and yours alone. May you use 1 Corinthians 2 to shape many ministries for the glory and fame of Jesus. Amen.